This is a revision video on When We Two Parted by Lord Byron for the GCSE AQA syllabus. As ever, this video is intended to be a guide, definitely not comprehensive, and your interpretations and opinions, when justified, will be the best way to achieve marks rather than anybody else's. But here are a few points if you missed what was talked about in class. I'm going to read the poem and then talk very briefly about a few things worth mentioning. When we two parted in silence and tears, half broken hearted to sever for years, pale grew thy cheek and cold, colder thy kiss. Truly that hour foretold sorrow to this. The dew of the morning sunk chill on my brow. It felt like the warning of what I feel now. Thy vows are all broken, and light is thy fame. I hear thy name spoken, and share in its shame. They name thee before me, a knell in mine ear. A shudder comes o'er me, why wert thou so dear? They know not I knew thee, who knew thee too well. Long, long shall I rue thee, too deeply to tell. In secret we met, in silence I grieve, that thy heart could forget, thy spirit deceive. If I should meet thee after long years, how should I greet thee? With silence and tears. What's it all about? Byron's narrator is recounting a breakup and the pain, sorrow and anguish he still feels for his ex-partner. The couple leave each other in silence and tears and he muses and thinks about what would happen if they met each other in the future. There's some interesting context, some historical background surrounding this poem. This poem is, is largely believed to be the voice of Byron and it was written about Lady Frances Wedderburn Webster and she was also rumoured to have had an affair with the Duke of Wellington and that event is what prompts Byron to write this poem. There is a fifth stanza of the poem that's not published, which is what leads many people to think that this is about Francis Wedderburn Webster. Um, and this is the omitted stanza which Byron wrote in a letter to his cousin in 1823. Then, fare thee well, Fanny, now doubly undone, to prove false unto many as faithless to one. Thou art past all recalling, even would I recall, for the woman once falling forever must fall. I think that fifth stanza shows a lot more resentment than is evident in the four published stanzas of When We Two Parted. And the naming of the woman Fanny as well, short for Francis, um, makes it much more overtly obvious that this is a poem about their relationship. Byron was a very interesting character in the time that he was living. Uh, he's a romantic poet which is partly characterised by strong emotions, which you can see in this poem, I believe. But he was also something as, of a celebrity of his time. He was described by Lady Caroline Lamb as mad, bad and dangerous to know. And he was most famous in, in society for his um, excessive spending of money and his relationships with high profile people and some of them extramarital affairs too. Moving on to the poem. When we two parted in silence and tears, half broken hearted to sever for years, pale grew thy cheek and cold, colder thy kiss, truly that hour foretold sorrow to this. So the first thing is that this is in the past tense. This relationship, in contrast to some other poems in the anthology, is over. It's ended badly in silence and tears. The line half broken hearted I would question whether he's implying that she didn't mean that much to him and that he is not wholly broken hearted or that one of them was more hurt than the other. Perhaps Byron is in a position where he feels much more hurt than Lady Frances does. This is also added to by the harsh language. Sever means to cut sharply. It's not to part simply, but it's to cut sharply and painfully usually, which emphasises the pain that the speaker is in. Throughout this stanza, but throughout the rest of the poem too, there's a semantic field of death and cold uh, marking the end of the relationship in a similar way to winter swans and neutral tones using winter as a metaphor for the end of a relationship or troubled times in a relationship. Byron's using a similar technique. An interesting technique he uses in this stanza is polyptotum, which is where you take the word 
for example, cold, and you use it in the same form or in a slightly different word in close proximity. So it's the idea of cold followed by colder by kiss, which makes it polypticon in this case. It's emphasising the end of the relationship and the lack of warm feelings within the couple. This is added to with the harsh alliteration with the cold, colder and kiss quite plosive sounds which is mimicking the tone and content of the poem as well. The next stanza, the dew of the morning sunk chill on my brow, it felt like the warning of what I feel now and that part ending with that sentence moves from being in the relationship and its end to where the speaker is presently to his current situation. Thy vows are all broken and light is thy fame, I hear thy name spoken and spare in its shame. It's not necessarily a point to mention at this point, it applies to the whole poem, but thy, thee and thou, which are used throughout, are more familiar terms, they're more intimate terms than you and ye, which could reflect some remaining tenderness or respect that Byron might have towards this woman. When it references vows, it could refer to the marriage vows, which um, a lady, um, lady Frances Wedderman Webster might have been breaking, or it could refer to the vows that are made in love from one partner to another that have been broken through the result of ending this relationship. And light is thy fame is fairly ironic given Byron's celebrity status, but he's making it clear to the reader that the person in this poem is a famous celebrity. I, I hear thy name spoken and share in its shame. The sibilance at the end of this stanza which is repeated S sounds, mimics the sound of whispering, which could suggest it's much like the secrecy within their relationship. They name thee before me, a knell in mine ear, a shudder comes o'er me, why wert thou so dear? They know not I knew thee who knew thee too well, long, long shall I rue thee too deeply to tell. So the first thing from this stanza to note is a knell in my ear. A knell means a funeral bell, which contributes to that earlier mentioned semantic field of death. The rhetorical question is interesting in this stanza. Um, it's interesting to note whether you feel it should be read in a resentful or a bitter tone, which suggests he can't see what he ever saw in the woman in the first place, or whether it's a genuinely sorrowful question. And that will depend on your own interpretation of the poem, which reading most draws you. They know not I knew thee is euphemistic. It implies intimacy and who knew thee too well. Long, long shall I rue thee. That repeated single word long is the technique of epizoixis, which is a repeated word immediately following the other. And it emphasises quite how much pain and regret he has about this relationship. Rue meaning to regret the person. In this stanza too, there's lots of double letters, um, lots of double L's and double E's in the in particular and deeply um, and double O's too in the repetition of two. I think the effect of this is that it elongates the words, it potentially slows the pace, um, almost if it's mirroring his pain and the sort of lethargy that's left at the end of a, a relationship sometimes. And in secret we met, in silence I grieve, that thy heart could forget, thy spirit deceive. If I should meet thee after long years, how should I greet thee? With silence and tears. So this stanza suggests that he hasn't moved on, but he feels that she has. So they met in secret, using the inclusive pronoun we, but actually it's him or the speaker that is grieving, and there's no suggestion that she is feeling quite so much pain as he is. The second rhetorical question in this poem, how should I greet thee? It almost feels speculative. They don't actually know whether they will meet again. Um, so he's just imagining what might happen in the future. The fact that the poem ends with silence and tears, which is quite cyclical, it's come back to the same place as the beginning. The second line suggests in silence and tears is how they end their relationship, suggests that arguably he hasn't moved on from this relationship. It's returning back to the beginning. In terms of the form and metre of this poem, um, it's A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, and it's a regular rhyme scheme. And you can look at that in a number of ways. It's got quite a sing-song rhythm, five or six syllables per line, usually. And could this suggest that he is trying to use a regular rhyme scheme, regular metre to cover his pain and pretending to be OK? Or could it be reflecting a cold distance from the relationship that he had with Lady Frances Wedderburn Webster? Thank you for listening.